casual conversations. Yeah. 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 Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. The Jason Cavanagh's Experience is brought to you by Cavanagh's HR. At Cavanagh's HR, we deliver HR to companies for you now to fear people. Our guest today is Dr. Spencer Cohen. Spencer, ready to be great today? Yeah, nice to meet you. Dr. Spencer Cohen is principal and founder of High Peak Strategy LLC, an economics and research consulting firm based in Seattle, Washington, specializing in regional economic analysis, international trade research, and U.S.-China relations. High Peak Strategy LLC works with a diverse range of clients, including ports, economic development organizations, engineering firms, industry and trade associations, and local governments. Spencer brings 14, year, 14 years experience in consulting, policy, and economic, economic research. He's a 2021 to 2023 Public Intellectuals Program Fellow with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, an affiliate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Washington. Thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So before we get started, can you give everyone like a like a high level history on China, like the background of China? I know, I mean, I, oh, wow. I know you can't do because I mean, like I think a lot of people think of China now, yeah. but China's been long, like like thousands and thousands of years, right? I mean, people don't know about what's called a box over rebellion, mm -hmm. how we kind of colonize it. Like, can you just like, give a quick overview? Okay. So five thousand years of history Let's in see two minutes. In two minutes. Um okay, let me do my best here. So um yeah, so China obviously has a very long history. Um, the first Chinese um, empire or first emperor was in 221 BC, but prior to that, there were multiple competing kingdoms and fiefdoms. There's what's called the Zhou Dynasty. And then after the, the dissipation or breakup of the Zhou Dynasty, there was the spring and autumn period and then the warring states period. Um, so you had a lot of different competing country or competing kingdoms that were vying for uh, hegemony over the, um, the Northern Plateau or plain of China. Um, around the Yellow River. And so, um, you know, so you've had, and then the thing to understand about China is that as much as we think about linearity and continuity, the very idea of, of what it means to be Chinese has evolved over time because we think about the Chinese today as the predominantly Han Chinese, which make up about 91%, 90% of the population. But even the notion of Han Chinese is a product of many other a much earlier sort of ancestral sort of different ethnicities um, that um, have their origins in the Turkic people, Turkey speaking people, um, Mongolian, many other types of, of groups. So it's really kind of an evolving idea over time of what it means to be Chinese. Um, I'd say today um, there's, you know, if we were to fast forward, I think for our conversation today, probably about what's most, because I can talk for, I can go off for a long time about Chinese history. So trying to be like succinct, you know, and, and comments about that, but um, which I, is Chinese history alone is fascinating. Um, uh, but, you know, throughout history, there's been a lot of, of concerns so chi about, you know, China's competing, you know, interests and also um, vying for territorial gains and protecting of their territory against other invading groups throughout history. The Mongols before them were called the Xiongnu people who are actually arguably the ancestors of Attila the Hun and the Huns, for instance. Um, and then Mongols later and like many different kinds of groups. So there's always been a, a, a really difficult territorial sort of um, conflict around their borders. Uh, what I would say is like, so fast forward to modern Chinese history, because I think it's really important for this conversation, is that um, a lot of the modern Chinese identity or, or contemporary identity is really formed, really the nationalist identity is really formed by events in the 19th century and early 20th century. So the last empire, the last dynasty of the, of that ruled China was the Qing Dynasty, and the Qing Dynasty ruled from 1644 until 1912 and 1911. And then after that, there was a, a period of this, you know, upheaval, warlordism, and then eventually, you know, the Civil War, and then um, this the victory of the communists. But throughout that period, the kind of decline of the Qing Empire, there was, um, you know, China really experienced what they consider to be what they call the century of humiliation. And that really began at the end of the Qianlong, Qian, the reign of Qianlong, who was the second longest ruler in uh, the Qing Empire, about sixty, roughly sixty years. And China went through this long sort of descent, and really, it went from being among the most powerful states in the world, one of the most affluent, arguably in, in many respects, 
to really falling way behind the West. China didn't have an industrial revolution um, like other countries, such as like a region such as Northwest Europe and elsewhere in Europe um, and in the United States. So um, Japan had the Meiji Restoration in the 19th century that really pulled it out of like sort of the feudal period and helped modernize Japan in terms of industry and then militarily. And China didn't have that, it didn't experience that kind of industrialization. There were pockets of it, but not really at such a large scale. And they became subjected to a lot of um, really sort of, you know, criminal sort of encroachments by foreign powers. So you've probably heard of the Opium Wars. Yeah, and there's another dude, I think it's called the Boxer Rebellion. Is that in there too? Yeah, Boxer Rebellion was later, but also um, throughout, Boxer Rebellion kind of really capped off a series of encroachments um, by foreign powers, um, beginning with the Opium Wars and then all the way through to the Boxer Rebellion in the early 20th century where Western powers and J Japan as well um, began to um, both you know, be able to, were superior militarily to the Chinese because the Chinese did not have the, the industrialization that these other countries had. And they began to ask for extraterritorial rights or demand extraterritorial rights, meaning that they could, their citizens were not subjected to the rules of the sovereign country, in this case, China. They had those extraterritoriality benefits. And so you've a lot of the treaty ports um, or what became treaty ports um, along the Eastern seaboard, as well as inland along the Yangtze River were formed during this period. So um, Shanghai, for instance, was a pretty small, essentially like a village until the British claimed it as a treaty port after the first opium war. And now that, that is really, if, you, if you've been to Shanghai, like the Bunds and um, uh, along the Pu River, like all of the, the sort of the, the modern sort of Europe, you know, modern European architecture, that all came about because of the, when the British and other foreign powers um, seized control and developed it as a treaty port. So the, I, I bring all this up because the, when we think about modern Chinese politics and modern Chinese geopolitics and foreign relations, and also modern Chinese nationalism, this they, the leaders oftentimes invoke what they call the center of humiliation, which really was all these events. And then of course, leading up to, and after um, the encroachments of the Japanese much later, um, the Japanese seizing um, German ports after World War I that were supposed to be re repatriated back to China because China actually did side with the um with the allied powers um during world war one and were promised they would receive those ports back or that that territory that the germans seized um and japan was able to wheel and deal to get those get for instance like Qingdao, which is a big port in the eastern seaboard and then the japanese invasion of manchuria in 1931 and then the broader invasion of the country in 1936 1937 um in all the the terrible crimes that were committed by um imperial japan and china so um that's really important to think about when we talk about China and we talk about how to really, what, how do we view or talk about Chinese history, especially modern politics? You can't ignore this center of humiliation that they're always referring to. So I'm speaking generalities, but it's like in the US, if something happened like two months ago, we don't care about it, we forget about it. Mm -hmm. We have like no long-term plans, you know, everything's like two months or like, like you know, the stock market quarters. Where China seems like no more like, you know, they remember stuff like literally hundreds of years ago and the plans is like 10, 20 years in the future. Like, can you talk mm -hmm. about more how China sees the world, how the U.S. versus how the U.S. sees the world, how that affects our relationship with them? Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Chinese definitely has they, they, they view their history in a large degree of continuity. So Chinese students, they really see like there there's something unique and special about Chinese history. And so students study that history kind of in the same ways, but even more intense that like when we're in school and we study um, Western civilization going back to like Mesopotamia, for instance. Right and Sumer and Urn, like we, the but we don't have that. We don't see ourselves as as I think a, a connected linear in a linear fashion, right, to those like ancient sort of antecedents to like Western civilization or like Greco-Roman history. Whereas China definitely sees that connectivity, and they they really um, they that's part of their how they view history, and it's I think it's a really beautiful thing. It's not many way respects the way that they actually um, see this degree of continuity, um, and it permeates everything. It permeates. Um, their education system, but it also permeates their, their language in terms of like idioms or sayings that often are infused in dialogue that have their origins going back to like, you know, different, you know, ancient periods in China. Um, but, and then I think that the, you know, certainly like, so they often think about geopolitics as well in the context of history. And that's why when I mentioned before about like, for instance, center of humiliation, um, China is always thinking about, you know, reclaiming what it views as like its rightful territorial sovereignty 
And, you know, that's why Taiwan is such a big issue, among other factors. Um, you know, China, when China tries to invoke, for instance, like its claims in the South China Sea, which has been a big kind of, you know, inflection point or, or potential fissure point uh, or flashpoint, um, they refer to what they call the Nine Dash Line, which has its origins, the Ming Dynasty. Um, so Ming Dynasty was like 1368 to 1644. Um, so, you know, and, and sometimes those are not well grounded or founded, but like, nonetheless, like they see things in like a broader historical context. Um, thinking forward, I think that there is, so a lot of people talk about China having sort of, or the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party specifically, um, having kind of a long run sort of view of, of history and law or long run forward looking, right? Looking far into the future and strategy. I don't think it's, in, I think it's true to some degree because I, but I think that a lot of that's inherent in the nature of communist parties. Communist parties as command economies, you know, have five-year plans. Um, that's kind of in the DNA, I think, of a communist party. The Soviets did the same thing largely. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, a lot, there's been a lot of literature that's come out recently um, by people that fault that China watchers that has really skewed to sort of viewing China as having some grand strategy or China having some grand sort of game plan and how they want to, you know, basically displace the US and become the dominant hegemon in at least the Asia Pacific and potentially even broader than that. Um, you know, for instance, like there's been books by Michael Pillsbury, by Rush Doshi, um, and a bunch of other authors. Um, I, I don't entirely buy into that um, because I think that it's, I think people are reading too much into the intentions or, or, or I think they're giving the, I, I don't think the, I don't think any government has the wherewithal to have that long of a game plan. They can certainly have goals, right? So reunification with Taiwan is a huge goal and it's a massive interest and it marshals all of the energy and reason, you know, of the Chinese people and it, it invokes nationalism, but like, that's a that's a that's an aspiration and a goal that they hope to achieve, but it's not part of a long term to have some sort of like documentation that says that we're going to achieve this, and here's how we're going to do it, and we're willing to be patient. Um, you know, China has a lot of problems they're facing now. I think that would that would interfere right or with any efforts to try to have a long term plan. Does that make? I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it makes a lot of sense. So, from your point of view, is the United States the only reason? One of the reasons, like they haven't tried to take over Taiwan yet. Because we have that, I think we have a treaty with Taiwan. Yeah, so we have the what's called the Taiwan Relations Act, which per, that authorizes the U.S. to provide aid to Taiwan, including lethal aid. So we do both aid as well as more, you know, more likely, more often the case, like sale of like you know weaponry and war material to Taiwan to defend itself. Um, it doesn't commit us to defending Taiwan, in, or it leaves it quite open in terms of okay. what that I think means. a lot of regular people think that it's sort of like tied treaty-wise to go like send troops over there to defend them. No, I, I think that um, it, it it's open to interpretation. And so that was one of the agreements as part of the whole phase where, because um, for a long time, the, the Gomindang, which was like, or people also refer to as KMT, but the government in exile that had been defeated by the communists in 1949, they fled to Taiwan. And so um, beginning with China um, in the 70s, the PRC, People's Republic of China, getting the UN seat on the Security Council, sorry, um, Security Council that was held by the Taiwanese government and then formal US normalization relations in 1978 with Taiwan, um, you had um, Taiwan kind of lost its status in, 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 the, in the sort of international order as an actual recognized nation um, or as the rightful government, I should say, because the for a long time, Taiwanese never tried to claim that they were a separate government or separate country, I should say, but they always claimed that they were the rightful governments of, of all of China. And so they lost that status in the international order when the U.S., when first China took their U.N. seat and then the U.S. formally recognized and, and developed norm, normalized relations under Jimmy Carter. Um, but that said, around that same time, the U.S. agreed then, well, we're going to you know, protect Taiwan. We're still not going to give up what, you know, our allegiance, our alliance with Taiwan, not alliance, but our, our relationship with Taiwan and with the, with the Kuomintang. And that's continued because of the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, that said, there's been a long sort of policy framework, for lack of a better term, called strategic ambiguity. And what that essentially means is that we don't tell the communist, we don't lay out in clear, in clear print what we're actually going to do to defend Taiwan. So, for instance, um, we have evaded, which I think has been, has, was, 
I think in, in that has been a smart strategy for a long time, although we're, it's now being challenged. But we have for a long time been relatively sort of evasive about what we would do if Taiwan, if the mainland government tried to actually attack Taiwan and try to seize it. Um, we have never clarified because in part of it's because we don't want to box ourselves in and in part because we don't know we don't want to get into a war with another nuclear power right so that would be unpleasant so yes, yes. <laughs> um and china also has a lot of capabilities that's largely you know and i'm not in i'm not a military expert to be clear but um china has a lot of capabilities now that are, are would consider be asymmetric um for instance they have surface skimming missiles that can that can attack they're designed to attack an aircraft carrier um, they've created essentially like a denial area, area denial zone, um, where it, because of the range of those missiles, it's almost, it's very difficult now to get carrier groups into that zone of, I think maybe like, you know, 500 kilometers, I'm not sure the exact range. Um, so they've built up these asymmetric sort of like responses to what is still a much more powerful U.S. Navy in the region. So um, the U.S. is quite, as China's continued to evolve as the second most powerful military in the world now. At least on paper, um, the U.S. obviously is much more reticent about you know, direct conflict with China. I mean, we haven't had direct conflict with them since the Korean War. We don't want to have a direct conflict. Nobody wants a conflict with China, um, but we don't want to feel, you know. So, but we are not committed to doing anything per se. And that, you know, we could feasibly, um, you know, we could, we could. I mean, there's, the whole spectrum has been undefined, right? So, if China did try to, you know, try to attack Taiwan, then we could have a hot conflict or we could just simply airdrop in aid to Taiwan, or there's a whole range of things we could do that we have not specified. Is there any type of diplomatic relationship between China and Taiwan? Well, so for a long time, um, so it depends on the government, right? So you have two competing political parties in Taiwan. So you have like the, the Gomidang, which was the, the original, I mean, it's evolved. The Gomidang evolved over time, but the Gomidang or what's also called the KMT, um, they were the, so uh, Chiang Kai-shek, for instance, that was his, that was his government. Um, and that was the party that ruled China for a while, then was defeated by the, in the civil war, defeated by the communists and fled to Taiwan. They ruled under martial law for decades. And then beginning in the lifting of martial law. Close the door fast. Oh, sure. Yeah. You keep on talking. Oh, I can just wait. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the so the the KMT ruled with, with, under martial law for a long time, and then begin the 1980s began to open up democracy, democratic institutions, and remove martial law. And then you had this now flourishing of a highly vibrant, highly robust, um, incredibly open democratic society that we have today in Taiwan. Um, the KMT is still a powerful party, but um, they're losing ground to this other party called the DPP, um, which is typically more associated with 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 independence movements. Um, the KMT um, never would never accept the idea of Taiwan independence. And so the KMT, despite being historic, you know, arch rival or enemies of the communists, actually developed, um, made real strides in building diplomatic relations. So um, KMT officials um, under like the Mindjo administration, which is the last KMT ruler, had visited, you know, had not he did not, but like, you know, had visited Taiwan. Um, KMT officials had gone to Taiwan, uh, you know, and, and had, some, or sorry, to, to mainland and had some dialogue and discussion. Um, Taiwan and China are incredibly tied economically. Um, some of the earliest investments in Ta in China after it opened up, beginning the reform period, opening up under Deng Xiaoping and all the foreign investment, much of it was actually from Taiwan. Um, however, the DPP has long been associated with um, a skew towards supporting independence, and the Communist Party will not accept that. So. There's better diplomatic ties with the KMT, um, but the DPP, it's very, very fissured and very tense because of that, because of the, their, the move towards independence. And they've not declared independence, but they've been, you know, it's, it, they've been viewed as much more of the independence party and seeking much greater autonomy and independence and potentially if, if they were unfettered, it, you know, would declare independence potentially. Now, isn't Taiwan like one of the big makers of chips in the world? I know there's like mm -hmm. a chip shortage, but is that like the high percentage come to Taiwan, come from Taiwan? I think the high, the very high, um, much more advanced chip boundaries are in Taiwan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like, um, uh, yeah, Taiwan is like the, uh, you know, TSMC is like one of the, the most important, if not the most important chip producer in the world. And it's not because of all chips, but it's the very, it's the really, really high precision 
um, highly advanced chips that are, are the vast majority are, are the most foundries for fabrication are in Taiwan. So now like in Korea, North Korea, like no one really like goes back and forth to travel. But I'm guessing in Taiwan and China, people can travel back and forth pretty much when they want to. Mm -hmm. or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's direct flights. Um, the, a lot of, you know, a lot of people in Taiwan, I mean, there's an indigenous population in Taiwan, but then there's a lot of people who either, and they're getting much older now, but like, um, or they're starting to die off, but like their, their descendants um, came from the mainland. So especially from places like Fujian province. Um, and then all over China, especially and anyone who was like part of the KMT army during the civil war that fled went to Taiwan for the most part. So, so let's suppose, I mean, you know, two scenarios, one scenario, somehow Taiwan became a fully independent country. China did nothing about it or vice versa. Taiwan become part of mainland China again. Mm -hmm. Would anything really change like economically, you know, domestically, mm -hmm. it, it's not like they're pretty much coexisting already. Like would anything really change? Well, that's a hard question to answer because the only right now, so on the first point, if Taiwan, Taiwan became an independent country, that would only come about likely through, or it would likely only come about after a pretty terrible conflict. Um, I, there's the Chinese government, the mainland government has really invested much of its legitimacy in the public's eye in really two things. Right now, they're out of the communist era. It's still a communist party, but like we're in like the sort of like the post Mao era. Um, one is economic stewardship, so that their legitimacy, the two pillars, economic legitimate stewardship, they are the party that's going to that is that it has been and will continue to guide the Chinese Chinese people and Chinese economy towards modern or you know sort of affluence and, and continued modernization. And um, so that's one big pillar. And the argument is that if you had another party in place or another government, we would not reap all the benefits. We would not be able to have all the benefits that we have because of what, how we, the communist party, were able to kind of steward the economy into this, like, you know, this miraculous growth period. The other pillar though is nationalism and central to that is Taiwan. If the communist party, and this is just to explain why I think that first scenario is, is unlikely. If the communist party, the communist party has, has really, I think, indoctrinated the population to believe that and the population believes this too, but I mean, I think they've really helped amp that up, like indoctrinated over decades, that Taiwan is an inseparable part of China. And so if Taiwan declared independence and the Communist Party failed to uh, to stop that, then it would be the end of the Communist Party, I think. I mean, it, the, the public backlash of a government, the government not being able to stop that from happening, or let's say leading a military, military uh, operation and failing, I think that would create all sorts of problems with the Communist Party. So I think they're in a situation where they've they don't even have a choice at this point. They would have to act forcefully in some way. It doesn't have to be a military course course of operation, but it could be, you know, some something else. I don't know what that would be. I mean, embargoing islands is really hard, but like, you know, something else would be really hard, right? They have to be done something coercive. But so I think like to your question about that scenario, um, I think maybe the other question maybe is like if this dispute didn't exist anymore, or maybe, you know, there's a whole slew of scenarios, right? Like maybe Taiwan eventually just succumbs to China's economic power and becomes part of China, or maybe in a far off universe, China becomes democratic. And if China became democratic and multi-party, then Taiwan would gladly, I think, become re re return back to, you know, rejoin with the, with the, the mainland government. Um, unlikely, but that would be, you know, certainly, and that's been something Taiwanese government or leaders have said was like, yeah, we'll join if you allow for multi-party, if you allow like the DPP and the KMT to function like normal parties in the multi, you know, a plurality economics, plural, plurality economic system or political system, then, then we'll rejoin. So, but setting all that aside, um, if I were, I, I think it would change to the extent that, I don't mean to digress, sorry. No, no that's fine. But, um, just getting back to your main question, I think the impact, and this is just purely speculation, is that right now, if, if you are someone, not you, but I mean, just figuratively, right? If you are someone who's deeply concerned about the rise of China and deeply concerned about the much broader expansionary aims of the, of the Communist Party and, or just China, um, not, just in, not just in the South China Sea or in the Taiwan Strait, but all across Asia Pacific, the Western Pacific, and then even going to Indian Ocean and Africa and elsewhere. If you're deeply concerned about that, then you would be concerned because 
about the resolution of the Taiwan issue because that's become such a focal point where China has to invest so much of its energy on Taiwan and it potentially diverts their attention from maybe these broader hegemonic goals that they seek to, they seek to pursue. Um, that's if you think that, right? And I, I'm not sure that China wants to become like the preeminent global power. I think they want to become a global power, but maybe not the preeminent like global hegemon, right? But a lot of people in DC think that. And that's the big concern is that, you know, China has these much bigger ambitions. They often point to like China has a military base now in Africa and Djibouti. Um, they've taken control of a port in Sri Lanka. Well, we can talk about that. And it's largely, I think, misunderstood what they did. But um, people view that in the Belt and Road Initiative, which that was part of Belt and Road Initiative, is, you know, has reached tentacles of investments all across the world spreading soft power influence and potentially, you know, other kind of hard influence as well. So I think if you really believe that China is out to be an expansionary power, and then you, you think, well, Taiwan's a great distraction, right? Because that means they're going to focus all their attention on Taiwan. Um, in the same way, I've heard people describe Ukraine as, you know, a great way to kind of concentrate Putin's energies on Ukraine instead of maybe some broader ambitions he might have, which, you know, so, um, yeah, so that's my, yeah. So not, not to compare China and Russia, but, you know, back when the Soviet Union, they, they invaded like Hungary, put troops in Czechoslovakia, invaded mm -hmm. Afghanistan. I mean, it, now Russia had people, they had people in Syria, the Crimea, all that stuff, now invaded Ukraine. I'd be wrong, but has China in, actually invaded anyone like in recent years, like the last 50 years? They haven't invaded anyone, have they? No, I mean, the last time, in fact, China even had a, a hot conflict was 1979, and it was against Vietnam. And it was, it was purely to, it was largely just to punish Vietnam, right? So they have, there was some modest, you know, sort of the border dispute, but it was really about the fact that Viet, China had sided with, with the Khmer Rouge and Vietnam had invented, invaded Cambodia to remove uh, Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge from power. And China took that as an affront. So they wanted to go into Vietnam and North Vietnam and just, um, just punish them. And they didn't actually perform that well. Um, you know, the, not that the Vietnamese army was was necessarily better equipped, but I mean, they had a lot more Soviet technology, but um, they had seen a lot more recent action, obviously. Yeah, had and all so, experience fighting us all those years. Yeah, they had much more, much more experience fighting us. They had seen even more recent action in Cambodia. And so, um, you know, I think that the, they actually, Chinese could actually, they'll claim that they, they you know, Deng Xiaoping was the paramount leader at the time and claimed that they achieved their goals, right? But it was really more of just a statement. And I think if you look, you know, the numbers and the casualty rates, I mean, they actually didn't perform that well. And there was really no meaningful change. Um, but to send a statement, you know, kind of slap them, you know, and say, um, because China has long viewed themselves as the sort of, that's within their sphere of influence. And Vietnam had actually been kind of a vassal state for many, for many centuries um, during like, you know, the Ming dynasty and earlier. And so... I think that that goes back to your question, actually your point before about your question about the longevity of Chinese history. Um, it does inform a lot of geopolitics in that way too, and how they view Vietnam as, at the time as a vassal, had been, you know, a vassal state, for instance, um, in earlier eras. But so, yeah, I think it, they don't have, they haven't done anything. I mean, they've been part of peacekeeping missions, which has actually been, they've been encouraged to do that by the US and our allies, because we want, you know, we're like, okay, China, like you keep talking, the big, you keep talking like a, the talk, you know, the, this big game about how you want to be a global, you know, a global power. Well, global powers go send peacekeeping troops or part of a UN mission, you know, and they, or, you know, they do things like that. So they've been trying to be a little more active in that space. Um, but they haven't actually, yeah, invaded anyone. I so. so. And I'm thinking, man, can you think of you're just like a regular Vietnam, Vietnamese person? You're like, man, we just fought the US, the, like the global war power. And now you tell me four years later, we got to go fight yeah. China now. Like, can you give me a break? Like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, and, you know, I mean, the, um, yeah, I mean, like the, you know, in the Vietnamese, like, you know, yeah, I mean, China, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's never ending, I suppose. <laughs> like, yeah. So if, was, it, if it continue to be, it's going forward too. I mean, and now the South China Sea is, is of course, a big area of contention with them. In the South China Sea, didn't like China make like, for lack of a better term, like fake islands in there or mm -hmm. something, or yeah, yeah. There's the Scarborough Shoal and the Spratlys, a few other locations. Um, um, so there's these archipelagos um, in the South China Sea and atolls, and so 
there was a so China has long claimed um, that they should have control of those different sort of like you know those I wouldn't call them island chains because they're not islands right they're atolls or but um, they've long claimed and that's largely part of it's driven by natural resources there are supposedly um, significant deposits you know of oil and in other minerals in the South China Sea but more importantly it's the busiest sea lane in the world and you know the South China Sea I forget the numbers but it's it's what it's it's if not the busiest one of the busiest um you know for cargo ships in the world um you got the straits of malacca at one end you've got you know all these different you know sources for production on the other end so um and for a long time and still like the us provides rights you know like open seas sort of protects like you know rights of passage and maintains sort of like you know the the sort of us maintains security still um and i think china really I think they have a grudge about that or they, that's it feeds into it is they want to be the ones who they view that as an um, encroachment on china's traditional sphere of influence um the and so there have been a lot of but his there even well for decades now there have been a lot of disputes with other countries especially the philippines no lesser than vietnam malaysia about um who has control of the south china sea and they've all you know have competing claims for different atolls and, and regions of the South China Sea and within their economic exclusive economic zone, which I think is like 200 miles from New York shore. And does like a high percentage of trade go to the China Sea? Oh, sorry? Like, does like a high tr percentage of trade go yeah. to the China Sea? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like it's one of the busiest sea lanes in the world. Um, if not the busiest thing, it's actually the busiest um, like sea lane in the world because of all the cargo ships that are moving back and forth through there. Um, there's been disputes over fishing rights. Um, you know, China is exhausted. Um, its fisheries, largely exhausted its fisheries in the East China Sea and elsewhere. So the South China Sea is like still, you know, a place where there could be a lot of fish. There's a lot of fishing that happens. And a lot of the disputes that have happened or, or flare-ups have been between Chinese Coast Guard that have been patrolling the South China Sea and like a Philippine fishing vessel, for instance. Um, so yeah, China has, there was a ruling in 2016 at The Hague. Um, I'm forgetting it's the it's basically it's the international it's a it's a it's a tribunal it's in a court for maritime maritime court for um oceanic maritime claims and it's just that China basically just completely ignored it so the ruling said this was an, in the Hague um ruling said that in 2016 that China um their rights are unfounded or their claims the South China, South China Sea are unfounded um it needs to remain open um and the you know the there are more grounded rights um, Philippines and others, um, but China just ignored it. They said, well, whatever. And they just went in and started building these artificial islands and they haven't just built them, but they've also now militarized them, which is the bigger concern. So it's not just that they built these artificial islands, but now there's an airstrip on it where they're moving military aircraft on and off. So, um, that so is, which, which in theory make it easy for them to strike different countries in the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So China is obviously as, as a communist country, we're capitalists. So talk some of the advantages and disadvantages of both systems, right? So like example, like I know like during when recovery first started, this thing all over the internet where like the Chinese government like built all these hostels within days. Mm -hmm. The United States seemed like it takes 10 years just to make one one sidewalk, right? Yeah. But but then like so just talk about how like that that works, right? Like is like in the United States were like more you no know, spontaneous, more entrepreneurial. So like mm -hmm. China's more like top down and like more resources, the government and business are so more tied together. Here in the United States, like there's like business and government are kind of at each other's necks, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay, for one, yeah, uh, always the case. I support capitalism over communism. Um, I think that so with China, so a lot of people point to like, you know, these, you know, rapid S construction of bridges and infrastructure and buildings. But um, I think. So two things. One, when we see these big skylines in Shanghai, for instance, like in the Pudong district, we should still remember that the vast majority of that real estate is held by state enterprises. So these are large state conglomerates that are run by the Communist Party through what's called the State-Owned Assets Supervision um, Administration Commission, which is how they control um, at multiple levels of government control state assets. So it's these are still, these are not necessarily like the government building lots of stuff that then the private sector can take advantage of, right? So that's one point. Two is that, you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, and okay, so in extreme, like, like in the US, like if you want to build a like a roadway, right? Um, in China, like, you know, in the US, we have eminent, you know, we have people have property rights, right? We have protections. Like you can't just the government can't just say, well, 
you know, we're going to build this road and we don't care that your house is in the middle of it. You just get to, you have to get up and leave. And here's some, you know, some very limited compensation for it. But historically in China, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to overstate it, but that's, you know, that's often been the case is that people don't have property rights in the way that we have in the U S so yeah, it takes a lot more, you know, there's a lot more litigation. It costs a lot more money to build stuff in the U S especially infrastructure. Um, the worst of it is like, you know, the, the efforts to build a high speed train through California, right. Which they spent what $5 billion already and got nothing out of it and just killed it because it's, you know, that's all like basically engineering and legal fees. But the flip side is like, well, do we want to live in a society where the government can just decide like there is no voice for citizens, right? There's no way to oppose or to challenge the government in any meaningful way. And so in some areas, like, yeah, that kind of command control economy would be beneficial when it comes to things like climate change, um, when it comes to trying to address like these big, what I would consider like, you know, market failures, where you have like the market cannot solve problems. Um, and only the state can solve it because the market is simply in, in, unable to solve these issues or these challenges or these collective action problems. Um, but the flip side then is like, well, do you want to live in a society where the government can just completely ignore your property rights or not even recognize your property rights? Um, so there's a, a difference. And a lot of the, you know, part of it too is because the Ch Chinese society is still, I mean, when we go to China and you see, when you go to China and you see like all the gleaming skyscrapers and you see all the vibrancy and the consumer culture, at first glance, it's like, oh, they've embraced capitalism, but only to a degree, like, you know, people, the government still has a lot of control over what one would consider like sort of the factor inputs or, or, you know, key sort of production inputs in an economy. So, you know, government still controls through various institutional mechanisms control, or, you know, where you can live. Um, it's really hard to, they have what's called a household registration system, which makes it really hard to move to a different city. Um, that's why we have all these like, you know, migrants and we've seen hundreds of millions of migrants that are in the cities working in factories, but don't actually are not actual legal residents, even as much as they'd like to be legal residents of those cities, they eventually have to go back to their home village. Um, the government still heavily controls the finance system, you know, like all these big banks, like ICBC, which is Industrial Commercial Bank of China was at, at one time was the biggest IPO in history, but still the government controls 51% of it. Um, so they still follow what the government dictates about how to, you know, their lending practices. And so, and same for land, like no one, people don't own land in China, right? If you live in a village in a collective is what it's called. Um, the collective owns the land technically, which is run by a village party, a village um, party secretary and village committee. Um, and then when that land is converted to urban land, so they tear down, you know, your dwellings, they rip up the farm, they build a skyscraper, and then you get some sort of compensation. Um, that land underneath the skyscraper is owned by the state. So when the government controls all those things, um, it's much easier to basically go and, you know, be able to build these really top down directives about how to, you know, build bridges. So, so next question, how is, is like the talent level of the U S government and China government different? What I mean, like in, in the United States, people <laughs> like Elon Musk, Steve mm -hmm. Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, they're not a government, they're like entrepreneurial or doing stuff out different stuff. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, better way to say it's like a best and brightest ongoing on government, right? So mm -hmm. like average people running the government. Is the best and brightest and the best talent in China actually in the government and making these, mm -hmm. these decisions? That's a great question. I think that used to be the case. Um, so in the pre-reform era, the best jobs, the best opportunities for per professional growth were in the party. Um, ever since the reform era, that's continued to, to broaden. So that now you're seeing a lot of really, there's a lot of talent in China. I mean, and not just people who are educated overseas, like people, China has some top tier universities now. Um, they've got lots of in domestic talents in the tech sector, in, you know, the auto sector with electric vehicles, in clean energy, in all sorts, in medical devices. Like, so there's a lot of manufacturing, like there's a lot of great, and there's a lot of really entrepreneurial people in China. Like there's there's the Jack Ma's of China, right? Or like the Pony Ma, um, you know, who, you know, and who runs Tencent and like, and so forth. And so um, you've got really, really impressive Chinese companies that compete with, you know, all these, like, you know, many of these US companies. I think the difference is that, you know, there's a bit more encroachment and infusion of the party into the private sector. 
And that I think compromises sometimes the entrepreneurialism of a lot of these people. And that's become the, the government's been making more of a push to reassert itself into these different industries in the last couple of years. And so I think that's kind of potentially compromised some entrepreneurialism. It's also had the effect too that um, when the government tried to clamp down, because the, the banking sector is still very, barely heavily skewed towards lending money to state enterprises. And so a lot of entrepreneurs who want to start companies often have to go to what's called the shadow banking sector or sort of like the less the unregulated or le much less regulated banking sector or credit credit markets, which mean higher interest rates, which mean less, you know, oversight, a lot more risk on the part of the borrower and the lender. And so when the government really cracked down on the shadow banking sector because how unregulated it was in the last few years, that really helped to further dry up capital available for entrepreneurs. So China's got lots of talent, but the entrepreneurial space is a lot more difficult to operate in, I think, than in the U.S. So Spencer, um, the trade deficit, is that something we really, really, really should be worried about? And then should we be worried about that like everything's made in China? Or is that just mm -hmm. the way globalization is nowadays and we shouldn't be concerned about those two things? Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of confusion, not confusion, but there's been a lot of mis uh, characterizing of in, in about what a trade deficit is, and then also what are the risks of a trade deficit. So first thing is like, when we talk about a bilateral trade deficit, right, like US-China trade deficit, that's not really how trade happens anymore. In other words, like, you know, trade is a multilateral activity. It involves many parties, many countries. Um, if you look at the share of net exports as a share of China's GDP, it's actually not that large. The reason being is that so much, even though China is a major exporter to the U.S., so many of the, they're a, what they do is they do fi mostly final assembly. So all of the different parts that go into like an iPhone, right, come from like South Korea, Japan, Germany, Australia, I mean, it's all different places. So to think about, you know, so in, in you know, back in the day, right, like a century ago, trade was much more of a mercantilist activity where it was all about, we had the gold reserve, you know, the, we had the, you know, we're using like, you know, like gold, you know, the, the gold standard and like countries were much more mercantilist and focused on, and it was less sort of di complicated of a supply chain. Nowadays, trade is incredibly multilateral, incredibly diverse and diffuse. Um, and so focusing on a bilateral trade deficit, which is what the Trump administration often pointed to, I think, because it was like so easy to point to that and say, look, it's getting worse. I think sort of um, largely was misleading. I think it was misleading because I don't think bilateral trade deficits are, are now, overall trade deficits are still important, but bilateral trade deficits have lost a lot of their meaning in the discourse on international trade. And so, you know, thinking about what, and so that part of it, I think is, is misleading. So we shouldn't be thinking about that in that way. What was your second question? I'm sorry about the... Oh, the um, you said about trade and then three deficit and then and then uh, it, should we concerned with that? They seem like they make everything over there. Oh yeah. Well, the other thing too, it just real is with bilateral trades is like it's not as if, you know, it's it's not as if when we have a trade deficit with China, we're getting nothing out of it, right? We get an iPhone, right? <laughs> like we're getting something. It's not like we're just like giving them money, right? We're getting physical goods in return. So that's another thing I think is often left out. And we're not going to stop buying stuff anytime soon as Americans, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of stuff that that is produced, and I'm, I'm not now to be clear, right? So China has definitely manipulated our trade relationship over time. Um, they did it for a long time um, through currency manipulation to make the renminbi cheaper, um, so their exports are more competitive. Um, but they've also done it through other means, to other mechanisms, industrial subsidies, all kinds of policies to retain a lot of that that you know the foreign direct investment. Um, so they can they can learn how to do it right. They can attract foreign direct investment. They can learn how to make those products and then begin to do it themselves. And that was one of the biggest gripes was, you know, all the way through the period was like China was doing that to to attract FDI, but then China was also um, more later, more more recently, trying to implement policies that would strip away the protections around trade secrets or intellectual property rights. Um, they tried at one point to compel. U.S. or foreign companies to have to go into joint ventures um, for in certain areas and have to disclose their their intellectual property with their JV partner. So they're always concerned about these sort of industrial policies aimed at trying to take away these sort of know-how and, and internal sort of knowledge and intellectual property 
that was so essential to a lot of these companies. But yeah, I think like, you know, so that is a concern. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we, we, you know, if China, if, if more manufacturing leaves China, it's not going to come back to the U.S. No, no, I think people yeah. don't get that. It's not coming back here. Yeah, it's not coming back. Like, probably go to Vietnam or somewhere else, right? People, people will point, and if it does come back, the employment footprint is going to be much smaller. You know, it's only going to come back to the U.S. if it's if it's going to be highly automated. If you had a hundred Chinese workers, reducing that down to like maybe ten U.S. workers, and that can be, those ten workers overseeing like five robots a piece, something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So it's not it's not going to come back. I mean, it's. Some of it will, depending on what it is. And some areas that, you know, this is where like supply chains get inter overlap or intersect with national security. So there are certain areas that the Biden administration has called out um, for special attention um, around national security. And Trump administration did this to some extent too, but I think it's becoming more institutionalized and formalized under Biden. Identifying those key areas where we want to make sure that we have that capacity. Because for a long time, you know, we didn't, we were, we had basically outsourced so much of our manufacturing capacity that it actually became eventually perceived to be a national security risk. Um, so that became a concern, or at least want to see those move those supply chains become either redundant or diversified into countries that we're much closer with, like Australia, Japan, Canada, and so forth, the UK, um, France, other other European partners. So. That part of it, I think, is is become much more of a concern. Is how do we address the national security concerns? And you saw it too with like COVID. I mean, we don't think about masks as like a national security asset, but it actually became one, right? And where who produces the vast majority of, of of masks in the world? And medicine, we found out. And yeah, like generic pharmaceuticals or the ingredients that go into generic pharmaceuticals, like yeah, China. So that was a big, that was also a big concern. So, you know, I think like um. I think that's where maybe the meat needle is going to move. Um, and a lot of that other manufacturing we talked about, it's going to leave China at some point, or some of it will, but it's going to go, like you said, to like Vietnam, to Malaysia, maybe to like Mexico. Because um, China is also not cheap anymore. You know, China, that's another factor is like China is facing demographic challenges. They've exhausted that cheap labor supply that they always kind of had the benefit of. China went from like, you know, at the, the at right in the precipice of joining the WTO in 2001, Chinese labor was about 26 times cheaper than the US. Now it's only four times cheaper. Um, so a lot of companies that now, if you're if you're a company that if you're like Tesla, for instance, you're also aiming to sell into the domestic market. And plus, there's a lot of stickiness, right? Once you're invested in a factory, it's hard. There's a lot of inertia that's hard to move that. And China's also built out all the port infrastructure all other kinds of roadways infrastructure to help move those products and has built up the ecosystem of suppliers too um, for certain types of products. And if you're selling to the Chinese market, but if you're a company that makes a, you know, let's say like a, a high labor intensive, low tech product that is not, is, is very commoditized and is not, you know, dependent on the Chinese domestic market as well, like, let's just make up like socks, right? Not to, not to besmirch what they do in Vietnam, right? But I mean, just like low cost textile production, you could go to Vietnam to a degree. Now, Vietnam doesn't have the, the, the absorption capacity that China has. No country has the absorptive capacity China has, but you could diversify Vietnam, India. I mean, depends on the infrastructure, Malaysia at some point for those kinds of products, but those are on the margins. I still think a lot of it will stay, but some will diversify it. Yeah, I, I know quite a few people have like stores, at Amazon Marketplace and their factories are in China. They go to China like once or twice a mm -hmm. year and overseas. everything. I know a lot of people do that. Yeah. So from your point of view, does the US and China look at each, look at each other as, as friends, foes, or just like high level competitors on the world stage? I'd say like high level competitors, um, you know, like no, the, the big concern is like, so high level competitors, um, and that's becoming increasingly sort of like formalized, so to speak, or crystallized um, through recent actions like the trade war. And then the Biden administration sort of, you know, really is that the Trump administration was like quite haphazard and chaotic in how they approached dealing with China. The trade war was not well thought out, in my opinion. Um, it largely hurt us more than it hurt China in many respects. And also, also hurt our partners or trade partners. And I think it, um, all of the really unfortunate, really nasty rhetoric, you know, that, that, you know, like racial epithets and like just lots of really just ugly rhetoric that was really kind of really unfortunate. Um, 
But I think that the core of the, the Trump administration policies is now being kind of formalized by the Biden administration. So we're moving in that direction of becoming much more sort of like adversarial, at least economically. Um, you're seeing that with what's called the, the, the entity list, which is essentially export control, so, or prohibition on exports. So it prohibits companies on the entity list, like Chinese companies of certain, in certain areas. US companies are prohibited from doing business with them. Um, you're seeing those kind of actions take place. Um, especially in the tech space. So there's definitely going to be a growing rivalry economically. There already is, but a growing rivalry economically with China. Um, you're also seeing the formation of alliances. I mean, this is where it kind of, you look at, you know, if there was like a NATO equivalence in, there is no NATO equivalent now in the Asia Pacific, but there's sort of the antecedents to that or the early kind of like, you know, green shoots of that, right? It's where you see like, you know, AUKUS, which is like this new sort of alliance of US, UK, and Australia, largely around the submarine deal, but also more broadly about sort of defense posture. The, the one that pissed France off. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that France, yeah, I mean, I think if they were, they'd be pissed off anyways, but I think that they were offering an inferior product to begin with and with a much longer time frame, that was not, it was, it was not relevant or it was, it was less, it was increasingly like, um, I don't want to say obsolete, but it was incre increasingly less, less useful compared to like nuclear submarines, right? And what we hope to achieve in our objectives in the Asia Pacific. Um, so I understand why Australia wanted to get the nuclear submarines and not the diesel ones from France, but um, still, yeah, the, the, it was not handled as, it wasn't as handled as well as it should have been, yeah. but, but that, and also, oops, um, you know, the quad, which is this alliance, um, quasi alliance between like US, Australia, India, and Japan, which was pretty dormant for a long time and was sort of like this very sort of ceremonial kind of really didn't have a lot of teeth to it, is now beginning to become a little more crystallized. They have more formalized and institutionalized with like, you know, like with meetings, like structured meetings and, and a timetable. So um, I think those in Japan's self defense force is beginning to, Japan's beginning to reassess, right? It's, um, how it wants to use its, you know, the sort of its constitutional limitations on how it can project its, its, you know, its military. Um, so you're seeing a lot of this sort of begin to form, and I think China's quite worried about that as well. Is what if there was a NATO type structure in Asia Pacific, and how would China respond to that? Um, you know, because of concerns China has about being of being of containment is often a, a phrase used by Chinese. And so, um, yeah, I think that there's um, where's it going with that? Um, Anyway, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think that there is a growing um, adversarial. Um, I hope, I don't think it, I think everyone like, well, okay, let me put it this way. I'd like to think that policymakers in DC appreciate and understand the risks of conflict. But then I hear people in DC, like in the last couple of weeks, calling for implementing a new fly zone in Ukraine, right? And I'm like, okay, then, well, maybe they're not as, Maybe they forgot a few things. Like, yeah, it's, so, it's, and that's, it's easier said than done. And that that's more like, you know, like, I mean, we're all obviously like really, you know, just horrified what's happening in Ukraine. But it's like, no, we're not going to open up an opportunity for like U.S. aircraft and Russian aircraft to get into combat, right? To go into combat, right? Like, no, that's, that would be awful. That would the, be... the servers are going to say, oh, there's a U.S., there's a NATO uh Project, right. let's we'll back let away. Go, yeah. Let's back away. That's not going to happen. So you hear people like that in, in BC, in DC, or elected officials in DC talking about this. And you're like, okay, well, I should re, I should reevaluate my assumptions about how cognizant people are in important positions about, you know, our risk with China, yeah. right, and the risk of conflict with China, because that's something where we most definitely don't want to get. I mean, again, because nuclear powers. I mean, two largest militaries in the world now. No. Like, yeah, I mean, good thing about the U.S., anyone can get elected to Congress. The bad thing, anyone can get elected to right, Congress. Right, right, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So who are the allies of China? Well, I mean... Like their go-to, like we can always count on Britain, of course, and Australia. Yeah. Like who can China count on? And, and not counting North Korea, of course, but do they have any allies? They say, hey, we're about to go do something. You have a back. I'd say it's maybe the other way around more. Um, there are countries that assume that China has got their back in some ways, um, like Russia. Although there's a lot of questions now about the 
how robust, despite the fact that they made that declaration right before the Olympics mm -hmm. on February 4th about the limitless relationship, the limitless friendship and alliance, how that's already kind of proving potentially be a real big headache for the PRC. Um, so, but certainly, you know, I think, you know, Pakistan and China have had a long history. Um, Pakistan arguably got the technology for the bomb from China. Um, and they have, but I think that a lot of, um, in North Korea, but North Korea is again, like China, China has this long standing relationship with North Korea. They fought for North Korea, right? There are many Chinese soldiers that died in Korea. Um, so North Korea is kind of like this little brother to China, but they're also a really irascible and the little, little brother, brother. They keep down the basement, hidden away, but banging on pots of pants yeah. the whole time when you're trying yeah. to sleep, right? Yeah. Like they're just this incorrigible, like, right. Just like very like difficult and, and can cause a lot of problems, but you know, that they, they do have this, it's almost like an obligation. Um, their political systems, despite they're both still Leninist party structures and Leninist political systems, but they're so divergent in terms of people's consumerism and rights and abilities. I mean, North Korea is like China in the 1960s. I mean, North Korea is so far behind um, and they become a headache. So it's not as if China can count on North Korea, right? It's the other way around. Like North Korea depends on China and what really, including actual shipments of grain and fuel over the, the Yalu River. And so um, I think that like, it, maybe this is me being idealistic, like, cause maybe I'm not a realist, right? I'm not, I'm more of an idealist in some ways, but I think that the US has like, and we have lots of warts, obviously, and imperfections, right? Lots of problems in the US, but we have the best, we have the best form of governments in the world still. And despite all our problems and how it's being challenged, but like, and we have this like in Western alliance, I think despite all our differences with our allies, um, we have the, we have like a big idea, right? Like there's a unifying, unifying concept, right? Which is democratic institutions, um, you know, belief in basic human rights. And we, we, we don't always abide by that. Right. But at least we have like that, that is a transcending idea, right? China doesn't have a big idea, right? Like China doesn't have this idea. Like, I mean, China has authoritarianism, right. And it's increasing authoritarian autocratic, you know, sort of Leninist party structure. Um, what did China and Russia really have in kind, right? They used to be enemies, right? Yeah, they they fought that. each other, yeah. right? And they almost went to nuclear war with each other um, in like the 1960s and early 70s. So like, you know, China, so what they have in common is that they both have an adversarial relationship with the US. Um, the what enemy did, and my enemies are friend or something yeah, like that. Yeah, what did, what did, what does Pakistan, China, what did the Pakistan and China have in common, right? They both have a, a something, especially with, but with China, adversarial relationship with India, right? They both share a lot of border with India. Um, so they have that, that connection, right? So I think that like China's relationships with its allies are much more sort of like transactional and much more fungible. Whereas like, I feel like, you know, the US and again, with all the warts, all the problems we have, right? And we don't have to go through all of them, right? But like, we have some sort of like, there's a, there's a, a salience in our relationship with like the UK with France, with Canada, I mean, just kind of Australia, um, with Japan, that is, I think, much more robust than what China has with its allies. So, and so I could be making this up. I remember reading somewhere, you know, that China doesn't want Korea, North Korea and South Korea to go to war because the South Korea ones have like a democratic nation on their border. Mm -hmm. So really the yeah. main reason they want this because all the refugees that would go from North Korea to China. Both, yeah. Both reasons. Both. I mean, you know, there's, I, the last, I, I haven't seen a number, uh, an updated number, but I remember like, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there were a hundred thousand North Korean refugees in Manchuria, Northeast China. Um, the border at the time was quite porous. I've been to the border. It's very easy. If you really want to, I'm sure not easy, but it's, it's at the time, um, you know, there's a, the, there's a large population. So China has 56 different so-called ethnicities officially sanctioned. Um, or recognized ethnicities, including the Han Chinese, but then all these other groups like Manchus, Hui, Tibetan, Uyghur, and so forth, uh, Zhuangzi, and so forth. And so um, there's what's called like the Chaoxinzu. And Chaoxinzu are like the, the ethnic Koreans that live in China. They're Chinese citizens, they speak Mandarin, but they're ethnically Korean. So there's a big population of ethnic Koreans in places like Xinjiang, which is like the big biggest metropolis in, in Manchuria. 
So you have lots of North Korean refugees that find sanctuary illegally in Northeast China. Um, if the Korean, if the North Korean regime collapsed, oh yeah, you would have a huge, you'd have a humanitarian crisis for one, which is you already have a humanitarian crisis, but you know, it would really branch out. You'd have lots of refugees that would flee to mainland China. Um, you'd also have, like you said, you'd have a unified Korea that would be a U.S. ally. Um, so you could potentially, you know, I don't think you'd have U.S. troops permanently or at all, right? I mean, you, you might even actually have U.S. I mean, it's possible you could even see U.S. troops leave South Korea um, if once the, the if that happened, right? And there was unification, peaceful uni or any kind of unification, right? When the North Korean threat was no longer there. But um, yeah, hopefully we're not, yeah, hopefully we're not dumb enough to put troops in. The former North Korea, if that happened, right? No, no, yeah, that would that would be highly. I mean, we've we've put troops near the Chinese border once before, and it didn't work out very well. No, no it didn't. So it, I think they would react in a similar fashion. Maybe not exactly the same, but they would equally be quite apprehensive. There would be some type of repercussions. Yeah. So so like you know I think um, I think yeah those are the two biggest issues. And then you know there's also like just the utter. I mean, it's really worrisome, right? That North Korea has nuclear we nuclear weapons, but if if the Kim regime fell and where do those weapons go? I mean, that just that alone, the chaos about where those weapons go and who has them. And, you know, China doesn't want some crazy, you know, sort of like, you know, rogue element in the North Korean military just to lob a nuke into Seoul, which they could, right? I mean, yeah. and there's almost no time, right? I mean, it, Seoul's what, 30 miles from the DMZ? Yeah, yeah. So. I was actually stationed for three years with my family, that, yeah. family or so. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's right there. The, mm -hmm. the plan was always, you know, they would probably, you know, knock us out the first couple of days and they would go back and get them right. But yeah, there's, because once they lost, there's nowhere to stop them. I mean, it's, well, even the conventional weapons could flatten the soul, right? Yeah, I mean, easily. it's so it's close. The, it's the military, yeah. Yeah. So if you want, yeah, I mean, some rogue, I mean, I don't think China wants that kind of conflict on its board, right? I don't think or so it's, in, its, in its vicinity in general. So I think status quo is ideal. Yeah, that, that's the problem with a lot of this. Probably stuff not, is... probably not a deal for the North Korean people, though, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe long run, but not in the media. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's task quo for them. Yeah. Definitely not. But that's the thing. Everybody wants status quo, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants status quo, but um, you know, whatever change is going to bring, that might think change be a good thing, but it might be a bad thing. Yeah, and sometimes you know we think we're trying to maintain the status quo, and then something happens we didn't anticipate. I mean, there were other periods of history where we had a disruptive emergent power come on the scene right around like in 1914 mm -hmm. right and yeah. so um and that's often i don't think it's a perfect analogy but that's often the analogy that that's most frequently brought up is you know the rise of germany pre-world war one and sort of you know german investment like challenging the british navy and like all you know that all that is the most common analogy people invoke when they talk about china's rise what are uh, is the u.s and china in any of the same free trade agreements well we're both part of the wto okay so we're not in a free trade agreement with China. We still have tariffs. And they, um, and they have a, I think, so a favor native nation status or something yeah. like that. So, so China, by virtue of being a WTO member, they have a permanent most favored nation status on trade. And um, what does that do for a country? Like it lowers tariffs or something or? Yeah, it lowers tariffs. Um, it's, you know, it's it prior to, so prior to um, negotiations for WTO, China's ex extension to WTO, um, the U.S., every year had to renew China's most favored nation status. Um, and that has to do with like also trade standards and all kinds of like sort of, you know, like technicalities around trade between countries. So if they're like a communist country and like quote unquote, like a competitor, why give them favored nation status? It's like it's kind of counterintuitive to do that. Well, I think that, so the thinking, and this has been flawed thinking, but the thinking back in the day was that, um, you know, we want, there was a belief that trade and economic integration would bring would would be would be uh which I think it has actually to be clear I, I don't think it's been entirely flawed but um by by in by bringing them in because China for a long time was a pariah state right up until the 1970s right China was this pariah state right like they had very few normal normalized diplomatic relations they were causing you know they were they were they were disruptive in the global order they were sending you know they're just they were not part of the system, right? So a lot of US policy was like, okay, ideally it would be great if China became a democracy, but we know that that's not that in the near term, that's not possible. And we're not in the, we don't wanna get into business regime change anyways, right? So what's the best way to kind of 
bring China into the system to make them more predictable, to raise the cost of doing something that's divergent or potentially disruptive to the global economy or global order is, is trade, right? Economic integration, it, make, it raises the stakes for any sort of action. It, re, it brings them, West, it also is a, a vector for bringing Western ideas and ideas about democracy and about rights. Um, and it's just good policy for Chinese citizens, right? And that's kind of what the, the goal was. And so there was the belief, even after Tiananmen in 89, fast forward to the late 90s, this belief that, well, if we could, we're already, we're maintaining, we're renewing our most favored nation status as sort of like a, a lever, right? Because if we don't, China's economy is going to suffer, but they would renew it every year anyways. They never didn't renew it. So if we bring them to WTO, we bring in a new layer of institutions and rules and norms that China would have to abide by that makes it more predictable, makes it, and also gives it us more access to the Chinese market. Um, so it's good for everybody, right? Um, I think that if you view it in that way, that's bringing in China, further integrating them to the global economy to raise the cost of any sort of divergent flare up or sort of, you know, like action that would be disruptive. And that was, it achieved, I think, that, that end. Um, I think people have been dismayed in some corners, in US policy corners, um, who were part of that, that sort of fervor and movement to get them in the WTO back in the day, because they thought that, well, this is going to reap even bigger dividends. Like there's the peace dividend. And there's like the, the idea that China's could become more like us in the process. And the Communist Party will become, you know, I don't say weaker, but it'll become much more open to different ideas and potentially, a, you know, a plurality at some point, or at least not, not a democracy, but at least some kind of pluralism. And that didn't happen. In fact, um, since 2012, with the ascent of, of Xi Jinping as the general secretary, China's become actually arguably much more authoritarian, right? After a long period of sort of, you know, sort of, you know, like bureaucrat bureaucratization and, and, you know, of the party. So I think from that perspective, people thought, you know, it's been dis dis disappointing, but in the long run, I think still it's better to have them integrate into the system, which is what we did, um, than not having them outside of it. I know about a month ago, I listened to uh, Joe Rogan podcast. He had a general H.R. McMaster on there mm -hmm. and H.R. McMaster pretty much like laid out everything that general secretaries did, did since 2012 to make it more authoritarian. Mm -hmm. So he did a pretty good job of laying it out, I think. Mm -hmm. So what talk about China, China and Africa, right? Is that a dangerous thing? Are they like people say, oh, they're there, like, you know, the quote unquote, take advantage and take out all the resources and take advantage of the people there. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, so the, the main sort of framework by which China um, get works in Africa is through what's called the Belt and Road Initiative, which you've probably heard of, but it's China's, the BRI, it's like China's, it was started in 2013. It sort of fizzled a little bit, a little bit in recent years, um, but it's kind of like, like, General Secretary Xi's like big pet pro like project, right? It's part of his legacy. It's been enshrined now in the constitution. And it's this whole idea. Um, so it's China's essentially um, answer to the World Bank and to like, you know, US and Western powers, like soft power. Now, now when and, I say Africa, are they actually in every single country in Africa or just certain countries? Uh, I don't. I'm sure they're in some countries. I'm sure they're not in some countries. I don't think they're in every country, but they're quite active in Africa. It's mostly, so they have, so it's mostly through um, infrastructure investments. Mm -hmm. So through the, and it's mostly through the Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, China helped establish um, what's called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and a few other institutions to kind of support infrastructure um, investments in the region. And then they brought in that with the Belt and Road Initiative too to cover Africa. Um, so China has made a lot of investments uh, in Africa, in, um, in infrastructure, port developments, airports, roadways, bridges. But most of that is funded not through, um, through direct aid and grants, but through lending to those governments. So it begs the question about if these, you know, the World Bank arguably needs to be broader in scope, but if the World Bank is not willing to fund these projects, because perhaps, at least in some cases, they're not economically viable, and then China comes in and says, we'll fund it. It creates a problem because, because these are loans. If these are an economic viable product projects, then they're not going to yield the return on investment that's going to allow those countries to pay back China in a timely manner or according to the, the original, you know, sort of like agreements, negotiate agreements of the deal of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, the debt. So 
there have been accusations that China is engaging in what's called debt trap diplomacy. No, I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. Where China will lend money knowing that the recipient borrower cannot pay it back. And as compensation, they have to collateralize as part of the deal to collateralize like the project itself or the land. And then China eventually seizes it in receivership of that, that land. And then they use it for other purposes. Or, so, or maybe the person power gets a whole lot of money and then we yeah. lose power the, the people in the country get hold, cut holding the bag, so to speak. Yeah, there's that happens. Um, the port of Hemantota in Sri Lanka is sort of the poster child of that, where that and, and that one actually happened prior to the Belt and Road Initiative, but analysts it got kind of rolled up into Belt and Road Initiative. And a lot of analysts pointed out and say this is a classic example of digital diplomacy where Sri Lanka want the Sri Lankan government wanted to build a port. China funded it. They couldn't pay it back. China then seized the port under like a 99 year lease and now operates it. But even that one, I think, is misconstrued because I think that the Chinese didn't intend to seize that port. I think that there was a lot of corruption, is my understanding, in Sri Lanka. Um, and there was really even no need for a second port. Um, the port of Colombo was actually underutilized and it's going to be a competitor port, the port of uh, Colombo. And so it was, it was a wasteful decision on the part of the local governments or the, the national government to try to elicit Chinese investments and borrowing um, or sorry, lending to them. So it was not, it was China kind of did not properly scrutinize the borrower and the project. And now they kind of are stuck with it, right? Because there's also concerns, well, because the Chinese growing rather with India, this could be a naval base in the Indian Ocean. I don't think that's the case. I could be wrong, but I, I suspect that China kind of fell into it on this one. Um, but, you know, I mean, there are, that is a big concern, like you said, is like a lot of these, like these projects are not being funded either, you know, maybe because by the World Bank, because they're not actually viable. Not that the World Bank has the best records per se on evaluating, right, and appraising projects, but like these are not products that wouldn't be economically viable and China's coming in. So it, it right from the get go, it's gonna be harder for the borrower to repay the debt. Or it's like, you know, there are other reasons, whether it's corruption or misguided sort of, you know, thinking on the part of the local government that wanted this project. Either way, it's really messy. And I think, you know, and that's why I think China's actually, they, they saw it as a means of trying to expand their influence into these other parts of the world. And then China also was, you know, for under Mao, China saw itself as part of the, you know, like the leader of like the non-alignment movement, you know, leader of like the third world, the developing world. Um, they saw themselves as really playing a pivotal role in that. And I think they still do. So being in Africa is kind of symbolically important to them because they do see themselves still as like sort of like, you know, leading like, you know, the global South and being an important like player. So Spencer, so the Bet Road initiative, is that, is that like the, pretty much like the second coming of what's called the old Silk Road, like the kind of, kind of same thing? Uh, I think they invoke that, but um, ironically, the road is actually, so the, ironically when the Belt and Road, the road refers to the sea lane. Okay. And then the Belt refers to the overland. Um, but, there, it's a whole mishmash. It's almost like a, it's a framework. It's an umbrella framework that almost anything can fall under. So a lot of state enterprises that are in the construction space or rail space will um, argue for the the by the importance of their product over their project overseas be, in the context of it's like, oh yeah, we want to do this, but it's because we're doing it because of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is what like Xi Jinping really cares about. So therefore, they get, you know, they they get the credit they need from the state banks to do it. Whereas if it was not in the they didn't frame it in the context of Belt and Road. Maybe they wouldn't get the money for that. Um, but it's so varied. I mean, you have these big corridors of investment. So you've got Africa, but then more importantly, arguably the most important corridor is what's called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And that links because Pakistan, you know, borders China on the West, China's Western, Western borders. And so they're trying to basically build largely supply energy supply lines overland. Um, from China, from Northeast, Northwest China to the port of Gwadar in the Sea of Oman or Gulf of Oman. And so a lot of infrastructure investments are being installed to support those energy supply lines. And there's been a big backlash because a lot of, even Pakistan, the, the current prime minister was like, you know, we don't need this. Like, I mean, I understand, we understand, yeah, China wants to hedge its bets because they're worried about you know, if there ever was a conflict with the U.S., for instance, like U.S. controls the sea lanes, so they'd need overland supply of energy if there's any kind of, you know, partial conflict, whatever, or flare up. But we need, you know, development is not just about building bridges. It's about human developments. It's about healthcare, you know, education, um, those kinds of things. So there's been a bit of a pushback now, but that is, yeah, like what the, what it's generally about. So 
so, so I know it seems like a lot of uh, Chinese students go to American colleges. From what you can tell your point of view, do, does the average Chinese citizen think highly United States? They think of like we're a place to go and make a better living. What's like mm -hmm. an average Chinese attitude on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to overgeneralize, but I think in general, I mean, you know, the average Chinese person, like they, they don't think like the Communist Party. I mean, they're, they have the same sorts of aspirations that people around the world have. Um, many Chinese that come to school here, they, they like being here. They want to be here. Um, they enjoy the freedoms here. They also enjoy the economic opportunities here. Um, even though China has become a much more affluent country in recent years, there's still a lot more opportunity in the U.S. and a lot more freedom to do the pursue things they want to pursue in the U.S. Um, so people, yeah, I mean, everyone that you know, like my wife is Chinese. She likes it here, like, and she was a she was a student here. Um, but I think you know, most people that come here really, I mean, the reasons they go back, I mean, they still many people still have a strong sense of patriotism and, and love of their country, so they want to go back. Their family's still back there. They want to raise a family back in China. But a lot of people stay if they can. I mean, if there's opportunities, it's become a lot more difficult from an immigration standpoint in recent years. And there's also been, you've probably heard of the China Initiative, um, which was a program under the DOJ that really heavily scrutinized um, Chinese academics and researchers in the US and had a, a little tinge of McCarthyism in there. Um, they've sort of basically shut down, honestly shut down, but really heavily scaled back the program. Um, in fact, there's a really good article in the New Yorker about this um, this month about it, about the, the the China Initiative that's worth reading. But um, you know, really aggressive scrutiny of Chinese researchers, you know, kind of a deep seated suspicion that they're they're, they're all spies. Or yeah, whatever. they're all spies. They're all like you know, transfer their research to even though a lot of it's un completely unfounded, right? Or the think the cases they find are are more an instance of negligence and just complete ignorance of the rules. Than actual like intentionality, um, but there is that deep seated sort of you know excessive attention paid on Chinese researchers now and scholars and academics in the U.S. So change the subject a, a little bit. Can you talk about what is economic impact modeling? Mm -hmm. So it's basically like um, it's essentially like if you're um, if you're a, in industry or any sort of economic activity let's say like you're Boeing, right? It's like Boeing in Washington state um, employs like 60,000 plus workers, 65, 70,000 workers. Um, economic impact modeling models the broader impact on the economy of that activity. So you have like the, what's considered direct activities, which is your direct impact, which is Boeing, right? Let's say Boeing has 65,000 workers in Washington. That's your direct impact, 65,000 workers. But you might also want to know, well, what about the supply chain? What about all the upstream suppliers? Like when Boeing buys carbon fiber materials from a supplier or tooling equipment or hires like an engineering design service for a certain part in Washington state, um, that creates lots of other jobs in the economy. So we call that indirect. And then you also have all these workers that work at Boeing or work at their suppliers that go purchase household goods with that income they earned. Um, well employed, right, through the, these activities. So they might go buy their groceries, pay for gasoline, um, go dine out. And so all the jobs at restaurants and like, you know, grocery stores that are further supported. So that's what it is. It's kind of like this like ripple effect. We often talk about like a multiplier. So there's a multiplier effect. Um, like for every one job, at let's say Boeing, there's like a total of like 2.5 jobs across the economy that are somehow tied to Boeing, either because they work at Boeing, or they're a supplier, or they are in an industry that Boeing employees spend their money at. So, so basically, if someone gets hired at Boeing, actually four people get hired because they cannot. But if someone gets laid off at Boeing, that means probably about two or three other people get laid right. off too. Okay. Yeah, you can look at it both ways. So when people talk about the economic importance of an industry, often for advocacy purposes, like they have a tax policy they're advocating for, um, or there's just some kind of they want to really elevate in the eyes of legislators typically why this industry is important, they often turn to like an economic impact statement to evidence that. So you, you're flown in Mandarin Chinese. Is it, is, it, is it actually Mandarin Chinese or just Chinese or just Mandarin or? That's it, Mandarin, yeah. And is it as hard to learn as I'm thinking it was to learn? Uh, I mean, I was never really good at languages, but so I had to live in China to do that. Okay. Um, but once you live there, I think it's just the immersion. I mean, I took more formal training too, but um, it's, you have to, because Mandarin is like really intonation based. 
So there are different tones and those tones can have wildly different meanings based on the tonality. So, you know, you have to kind of be there, at least for me, like I have to be there. I have to immerse myself and hear it all the time. And then, you know, that's, that's, it's a language I think you have to really, and then of course, I think the added difficulty is just the characters. So it's a lot of memorization of characters. Um, unlike, you know, like you can't just look at a character and figure out like if you haven't recognized it, right? I mean, there's some, some there's like, you can kind of guess because it has like a, like maybe the radical is different, but the main, the main components is the same as another character. So you can kind of guess how to pronounce it within a range, but it's not like learning Spanish, right? Or any sort of like, you know, like, you know, alphabet, you know, Romanized, Finesized language. Like, and how often do you go to China? Not recently, unfortunately. No. Um, in fact, the last time I went there was 2018. Okay. And when so, you go, you go for like just a, a couple of weeks to do business. You stay there for a while. Uh, it ranges. Like I've been going back and forth since 2001. So I lived there for a while um, to study the language. And also um, I did my doctoral field work in China. So I did spend a lot of time there doing research. Um, and I spent long stints as like a language student in China do like, you know, formal programs. Um, and then like my, as I mentioned, my wife's family's from China. So go back and visit family. Um, and then for some business too, some business trips. So yeah, just like, you know, it ranges. I've gone for a week and I've gone for like, you know, I've stayed for a year and a half. So it just, just ranges, but I haven't, unfortunately, um, I would have gone in 2020, but then, you know, and then, I mean, I could go now possibly potentially, but then I have to like, you know, if, if I only have two weeks and I have to quarantine for three weeks in China in a hotel room, it's not really math doesn't work. Right. So no, it, it does not, doesn't work at all. Can you talk some about the supply disruptions going on right now across the world? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that there's been a lot of, um, so obviously everyone's like pay attention to it, but, um, they're really a couple main drivers as I see it. Um, so you've got, you know, factory closure. So let me step back. So in 2020, a lot of retailers in the U S, um, decided to, did not like, we live in a system, right. That's like just in time logistics. And so a lot of retailers on the margins really let their, even though they do maintain some inventories, they let those inventories dwindle because they had no certainty about what demand was going to look like. Right. Cause we're all you know, we're all cloistered in our homes and like, you know, no one knows that this is going to be the end of the world or like, you know, so a lot of uncertainty, the first couple of months of COVID were like quite shocked. I mean, just the numbers, right? Like the, the, the unemployment rates were just like abysmal and unprecedented. Right. So it was, we're living in a new paradigm. And then, so a lot of retailers like let their inventories scale back or diminish. Right. And then all of a sudden, and then you combine that with people's behavioral changes that meant, because then we got, we, people were made whole from the fiscal stimulus programs, right? And expanded unemployment insurance. So a lot of people were actually, in some cases, even getting more money, right? Than they earned when they were working. And so people's spending power picked up again pretty quickly. So you had, and then so people were able to spend, but they shifted because they couldn't go out to eat. And even if they could, right, or do outdoors purchasing um, consumption, like they were reticent or less less willing to do it all the time. So people shifted their consumption more towards skewed more towards physical goods. They would buy on like e-commerce platforms. So you had this like behavioral shift in consumption, and you had the retailers scaling back a bit, um, you know, their inventories, and then all of a sudden, and on top of that, you had um, you know factory intermittent factory closures overseas. Um, that created a lot of problems like in Vietnam and China that really disrupted a lot of production. And so, and then all of a sudden, like retailers decide in 2021, they're ready to start building up their inventories again. Consumers had all the purchasing work, were shifting more and more their consumption to physical goods that were imported, right? As, as opposed to like, whereas you might've gone out to eat at a restaurant, you bought like some random device on Amazon instead, right? That was manufactured in Vietnam or China. And so that confluence of factors um, combined with a, a logistic system, a supply chain system that was incredibly fragile and had a lot of vulnerabilities. Like we had issues even going, going into the pandemic, we had truck driver shortages, especially long haul truck driver shortages, um, which are critical linchpin to the supply chain. I mean, you've got the drayage, which is the short, right? The ports ship moving the boxes from like the port to like a transloading facility. 
then you've got the long haul drivers that have to bring them to like, you know, the distribution centers and like Walmart, Walmart distribution centers and what have you. And there's a big shortage of those already. And those drivers are getting sick. Um, you also had limited warehouse space. And then, so all it took was a little nudge, I think, to really knock the whole system out of, out of whack. And that's like, that's what happens, right? And then you get a ship stuck in the Suez Canal just to add a little bit of cherry on the Sunday. So all those things together um, really combined that confluence of factors, I think, on top of a very fragile system to begin with is what really caused all the backlogs where we saw like, you know, 106 vessels either anchored or adrift waiting to be unloaded in San Pedro Bay, then LA Long Beach, which is the biggest. Yeah, I mean, everyone's seen the pictures, right? All those yeah. ships out there. Everyone saw pictures there, was, but it was happening everywhere though. Just not, that was the extreme case, but part of it's because, you know, we had it here too, but just not as much because there's just none, of, there's not enough space for ships to actually anchor or be adrift in Puget Sound or the Strait of Juan de Fuca, right? I mean, it's just, there aren't enough bays and areas outside of the shipping lanes where they could do that. Whereas San Pedro Bay is just massive, right? I mean, it's just a huge, a uh, huge bay. So, um, you know, so that's, that's, those are the main factors, I think. Um, and is it getting better or is it going to be like bad for a while? Oh, it's getting better. I mean, it's, it's beginning, you begin to see that it clear out a lot. I mean, you know, you still have, the backlogs, but those backlogs are being cut down. But um, I think the underlying problems going into the pandemic have not been resolved. So, you know, you still have a trucker shortage that's projected to get much worse. I mean, it was 80,000 projection before it's projected to get like what 150,000, I think by 2030. Um, so you have to address that problem. And that has to do with like, I mean, all the challenges of truck driving, right? I mean, long haul truck driving is a really hard job. Um, and then you fold in issues of like drug testing in other states, you yeah. know, and, and I actually have a friend who owns a trucking company and he was telling me that they're now they're even considering like, you know, people like DUI, stuff like that. They would never, mm -hmm. they would never consider that before. Now they're this, he said, we're not hiring them, but we're, we're now considering them, you know, yeah. was it 10 years ago, you know, five years ago there before it's DUI, I don't apply. Now they're like even considering that, which is a big change, I think. And what do you do about like, like drug testing, right? Cause like some states legalize cannabis some don't yeah. and then like how do you negotiate that and the problem too it's it's, it's like you have the, the it's a hard job to begin with you have hard limits on how much they can drive every day yeah. I think it's like 11 hours so and if you're a truck driver now it's like well okay with all this it's kind of this like self-fulfilling prophecy right or like this negative cycle because um if you're a truck driver and there's a shortage of truck drivers you have this big backlog right the port these boxes and you're waiting in line in queue to pick up a box or pick up cargo. And it takes you like eight hours. Sometimes you wait like eight hours to pick up cargo. It's like, you must not even bother because you can only drive three hours after that. And then you literally, there's like an electronic, like, you know, yeah. device that tells you. It's not like you, you like, can get overtime, right? Yeah, no, it's, you can get, you can lose your license. You can use your CDL if like you go over your 11 hour limit. I think it's 11 hours that limit. So um, that's a hugely, right? I mean, prohibitive factor right and it's just a it's just a hard job and maybe at some point they talked about like growing like there's efforts around automating not getting not getting rid of the driver but at least those those long periods to make the job easier where like the driver can kind of step back right and you have like for the highway sections you know that it's yeah. automated and the driver just takes the helm like you know when it like enters like an urban 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 environment but yeah it's not it's, i don't think it's going to get any better um so, so Spencer, talk about um, the um, public intellectual program fellow that you're on. Sure. Yeah. So um, there's this organization called the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, which is uh, the biggest or the only, really the biggest, I think, in, you know, organization devoted to a nonprofit, non-governmental organization devoted to facilitating um, better U.S.-China relations. Um, and so it has a long history. Um, I think it's, you know, it's many, many decades in existence and, um, it has a lot of like kind of, you know, people who have been heavily involved in the field of U.S. relations on its board. So like, you know, Henry Kissinger is still involved. Um, Jacob Liu, who was like the treasury secretary in Obama. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I thought Henry Kissinger was dead. No, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I yeah, thought he's, he was he's like 95, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've not met him to be clear. Just say like, you know, I, I, I just, these are the people involved, like lots of interesting people like are heavily involved and have a really impressive resume in China are involved. And um, so they have this program. It's I'm the seventh cohort and it's called, yeah, public intellectuals program. And it's basically, it's a program designed to encourage 
um, academics mostly, but anyone involved in China who's like really steeped in China and US-China relations to really make their research and make their, their findings accessible to a broader public um, in order to facilitate a more informed discussion around US-China relations. Um, it's mostly academics. Um, I'm kind of the outlier. Um, usually it's like maybe three quarters academics who are like really kind of ivory tower, like heady research on very specific areas, whether it's like history or pol political science or economics or sociology or geography. Um, I even, I have a PhD, but I'm not an academic. Um, I mean, I'm affiliate faculty, but I'm not, I'm not on an academic track. I'm a consultant. Um, so usually there's like a few people who are like outside of academia who are also part of the group. Um, so those would be in my case, like in my cohort, it's like me, um, there's a naval commander and then there's like a, a, a investment fund, investment firm. Um, and this is like a, a government agency, a nonprofit? For it's non-government. Okay. Yeah, nonprofit, non NGO. And so they do things like it's a two-year program, although, yeah, it's a two-year program and we have a series of workshops um, in DC. And then we just, I just last weekend, we have one in San Diego. I'm guessing it's pretty competitive to get accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty competitive. It's a really great program. It's 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 a really excellent program. Do you have to be nominated by someone? Or you 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 apply? How's that process work? You apply, but you have to have like referrals. Okay. So, um, yeah, and it's just they teach you like you know you learn, you interact with it. Part of it is like, part of it is like interacting with other public intellectuals. So people who are, you know, whether they're in like working for like think tanks or in academia, but with like a really like prominent voice in the public domain on US-China relations, interacting with them, having them talk, talk to you about their experiences and what they do, and also like training. Um, so learning about, you know, how to write, a, how to really, you know, what are, what are best practices for engaging the public, how to really hone your message um, to get, because, you know, instead of, you know, people's eyes glossing over, blazing over, right? When you talk about a bunch of like, you know, sort of ivory tower abstract concepts, getting to the main point, and then, yeah, just like talking to people like, you know, who are in policy as well. So um, when we were in DC for our last workshop, we met with a lot of people from like, you know, State Department, Defense, um, National Security Council, um, you know, US, US Trade Representative Office, um, and all, all sorts of interesting people who are directly involved in policy to learn about what kind of information do you need um, to help to, what are you looking for from it, from a, some, all these different areas of expertise that we offer, like, what can we offer to you that help inform your your work? So Spencer, recent years since like you know the war intellectuals to have this negative connotation, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for you no know, for whatever reason. How do we get back to the you no, know, no, we need intellectuals, you know, intellectuals lead our country, they move us forward. Being an intellectual is actually a great thing for our country. How do we change that? Yeah, that's a huge, that's a big question. I mean, I think so. My my interpretation and it it's just mine, right? Like, but I think that there's been a big backlash against expertise. And, you know, and we saw that, I think there was a, a part of it was, was, I think, a, a class, I think that people generally, not always, but there's a perceived class division between people who have the time and energy and just resources to like, go to college and get a PhD, right, or whatever, and those that don't. And I think that those people, the people who who are in that group of like highly educated were not, they became kind of like, like almost cloistered off and they were not listening to like what the other rest of the world, the rest of the population was experiencing. And I think that division became really unfortunate. So I think like having the people who are self-declared intellectuals, right? For lack of a better term, maybe like they need to really re-engage with the public and really listen to people, like not tell them or not dictate policy or say, this is good for you, this is good medicine for you, but no, like they know things you don't know and understanding like what the average person on this is experiencing, whether they're like a manufacturing worker or they're really, you know, in a services industry or they have different, you know, unique circumstances. Like if people in academia and those experts need to listen and, and be much more empathetic and respectful too of like those people, you know, there's a, an, an easy tendency, I think, for people to like, you know, like, look down upon people like in per parts yeah. of the, like you've heard the phrase like flyover states yeah yeah i mean yeah. it's such a terrible term right it is. It's, it's such so a bad. it's such a so so disrespectful so disrespectful so condescending and i've been in i've been in events where like people say that and it's like oh really 
Like, cause you can learn a lot by stopping in those states. There's a lot you can learn as an, as a, as an intellectual, right? Um, and it's really extreme, right? In Seattle, right? We live in this yeah. bubble in Seattle where it's like, you know, I think that more people in Seattle need to like go to other parts of the country and not just New York, right? Or so, so, so I joke around, like I told you before I live in DuPont, right? Have a joke that people in Seattle, they think anything south of the airport is like Mexico. Right, right. yeah, it's, it's probably pretty accurate, right? <laughs> I mean, the perception, but the other thing too, is like the, um, the, like it, we saw this really play out in a really destructive way during COVID, right? Because, you know, you had like, you had a lot of like, you know, distrust of science and distrust of, you know, expertise. Yeah. I, I think it came from people like, well, the public can't handle the truth, you know, don't tell them everything. Right. We'll, we'll tell them this, but we really mean that, you know, and they got caught, you know, telling how to, or what do you want to call it? And mm -hmm. the people called them on it. Like, why would you trust anything you say now? Or, or just like some like, like modesty, right? Like to say yes. like, like, Hey, like, you know, this is an entirely new thing. Like I have a PhD in immunology and an MD or in virology or whatever, but like, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I think that, you know, I think that taking these measures is going to work, but you have to, you have to, but I don't know for sure. Like, I don't have the certitude, but this is my best. We've never dealt with this before. So this is the best thing. And if instead, there's a, instead of saying, if you question me, you're questioning the science, right? But right. you're supposed to question the science, right? Yeah. But the thing you're supposed to, you should question the science, but also think that there was also on the other side, there were the, a lot of people who felt like I read this online. So that yeah. makes me just as well yeah. informed as someone my, with a my, PhD. My, my, my Facebook PhD. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's like that, that willingness. And it's like that deluge of information that people didn't have back like years, like several years yeah. ago, where it's like, now it's like, you can just pick and choose. So if yeah. you're like, I don't want to do that because even though the people with the PhDs say this or the MDs say this, like it doesn't contort, conf, you know, conform with what I want. And I can or, find or, this. Or my friends say the same thing I do. So that's really re-emphasize re the yeah. falsehood. Yeah, it's craziness. Like, I'm just like, you know, like, like my attitude's like, hey, like, you know, I'm not a doctor. I mean, so I'm going to just, I'm, I mean, my money's on the people who've like studied like diseases exactly. and infectious disease and you know who are qualified. Or oh, when people said I did my research, really, you did your scientific research. Yeah, you read, you read, <laughs> you, really, yeah, really, you did his research. And it's, but it goes both ways, right? And it's also like there's a bit of elitism on the on the left or the, or not the left. I don't want to say left, but like in that field where it's like, you know, it's like a, it's a both ways, right? Like people with like like have like a morally virtuous or superior position by telling you, you should do it this way. Right. Like, yeah. Oh, you're not wearing a mask and, right and, now. And like, it made it worse when they got caught, you know, going out to dinner with a little mask. Themselves, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Oh, the hypocrisy is so, but it, totally. And it's like, I just wish we could just like step back and be like, okay. And we're already also through this. Right. But like, like, I wish we could have just stepped back and say, okay, time out. Like, like, let's just strip away all the, 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 let's try, let's try, let's not condescend each other. Let's just, okay, this is not, this should not be a political thing. This is just like, okay, you, you know, like the doctors, like you're doing the best you can. And you guys with the, you're the people with the qualifications of science, um, you know, tell us what you know, but also be, be clear that these can change. Right. And we should brace for potentially changes because as new, we want people to adjust their opinions as new information arrives. Right. Like we want the science to be updated. Right. So and then we're not, we're going to trust you. Right. And I just wish there was more of like, I mean, I don't know. I just, yeah, I just, no, I wish there was that. I agree. That, now, one thing about our life, we got very, very lucky. I think, right. I mean, people died in every life precious, mm -hmm. but the big scheme of things, I think we got very, very lucky. This was nowhere as bad as people, people thought it was going to be. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but then it, right. It, but I don't know how many Americans ultimately died from it, but like, I forget the numbers, but yeah, I mean, it's, it could be much worse. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it, it leaves, maybe it's like a, a primer for the, the much more like, you know, the yeah. much worse. Like, to get us ready for the big one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So next, Spencer, can you talk about your company, a uh, high peak strategy, like how you got started, where the idea came from, mm -hmm. where you're focusing now, what's your vision for the company moving forward? Yeah. So, um, so I always, I had been in consulting for a long time prior to starting my company and I just always wanted to start my own business. It was always an aspiration of mine. And you know, kind of ironically, one would say like, so I started my company in 2020. Um, like in the, in the late fall, in the fall of 2020. And which is typically not a good time. One would think to start a company during a global pandemic. 
But but, um, actually, that's the best time because back in 2008, the great greatest sense like Airbnb started, you know, mm-hmm. all the Instagram started. So, statistically speaking, the hard that's actually the best time to start companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. And like I, I think on top of that too, like for me, I think the um, it was ironically working from home gave me the confidence that I could start my business. So I'm like, you know, like this, I was it was a level playing field now, right? Whereas before, it's like if I start my own business, I'd have to like really invest all this energy and in, in structures and systems to like go out and like, inter, you know, like even invest in an office or whatever. Right. Like, and now it's like, no, it's like, everyone's working from home. It's in, the, the loving, the playing field has been leveled. And so, you know, I just felt, and I, and I demonstrated to myself that I could actually, I could do it at home. Like I have a good office set up. I was being productive. And so um, it gave me a lot of confidence. So I finally just took the leap and did it. Um, and it's been really rewarding. I mean, I do, um, and it's really fun. I mean, it's been exciting and fun. It's 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 fun to be entrepreneurial and try to build your brand. Um, what I offer is, you know, independent analysis around kind of three really you know core areas. So that would be you know U.S. China relations, international trade and port operations and trade, and then regional economic analysis. And so I bring a lot of that. I bring that to my clients. Um, there's often like different types of needs that they have. If they're, you know, if they're, they want to understand how a lot of the sort of volatility in global economy, especially U.S.-China relations, is impacting their potentially impacting their business or their clients. Their clients. Um, I offer um, a narrative or often explanation and sort of a an, you know an explanation and an understanding of like the potential risk factors that could play into um, their operations and what they should be aware of. Uh, when it comes to port operations, it's helping them, whether it's to understand their impacts or, you know, understand like supply chain disruptions as well. I've, did, I've done a lot of work around lately, what impact that's going to have on them long-term, what's all, what in that, how that might inform a broad understanding of the, the, the trends and what that might do to their business or their operations and whether that could potentially result in changes in trade flows over time and cargo shipping, lane, shipping flows and how that would alter their business. And then for regional economic analysis, um, a lot of work at the local level, um, you know, with not just governments, but also industry associations who have a need to demonstrate what their impact is on a community or an economy. So, you know, I've worked with like, you know, the wine industry, I've worked in, you know, like, you know, with ports, I've worked with um, other like manufacturing, I've done the tech sector. And then in my earlier life, when I was working as a, with another firm, I was doing, you know, aerospace, maritime, um, agriculture. So just working in all these different industries to help them, you know, really build the right messaging and, and analysis that they need to advocate for different policies. So, so how do you find your customers? Um, it's been kind of funny, like for the most part, they found me. It's been really like fortunate because, um, I mean, I, I definitely try to, I find they find me, but I I am quite I don't say aggressive, but I should be more aggressive. But um, I try to be like in the public domain as much as I can. Um, I write op eds. I'll yeah, I saw out. on LinkedIn you do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. You do a lot of op eds, a lot of speaking, public mm-hmm. speaking opportunities. Yeah, a lot of public speaking opportunities. Um, um, you know, all kinds of kind of engagement. And, and are your customers mainly in the Seattle area, or the, across the West Coast, across the nation? Uh, mostly like the the western half of the U.S. So I've worked as far east as like part of Houston. So I've done work in Texas, Arizona, Colorado, California, um, most are in Washington state, but I try as much as I can, um, just because I find it really interesting to work in other parts of the country, um, try to get out as much as I can to like further and further east and south. And so, yeah, and then um, as well as like some work in China as well. With some with some consulting firms in China that I've worked with, do a lot of Chinese companies bring you on to help you help them come to the United States? Not now, just because um, I started my company um, during the pandemic, and it just there was like complete dry up of any sort of FDI, and the 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 environment for foreign direct investment from China really dried up because of um, the sort of um, kind of like worsening um, U.S. China relationship in the climate for US China relations really soured. And so, and then the Trump administration implemented a lot of rules that made it more prohibitive or difficult for Chinese firms to invest in the US. Um, so you didn't see as much of it um, happening, but it, but mostly just with the US companies trying to, and 
some Chinese companies have tried to ex explore like, well, what, how has like, for instance, like tech policy, how is tech, how, what is the, U, what is the current state of U.S. tech policy towards China in terms of like, you know, what is their, what is our policy in the tech space vis-a-vis um, -vis China? And so trying to unpack that for them and what direction it's moving in. So, I mean, obviously don't tell the details, but do you charge by the hour or by project or just a combination on case by case basis? Just depends. How yeah, you charge. it just depends. Like I have like a, an hourly rate that I'll charge if it's something very like, you know, kind of a la carte or like they have like a, you know, a task set of tasks, but most 99% of the time um, I will just, I will scope a budget for the project based on their needs. And then I'll, I will agree on that price and I'll execute on that. And they'll just get, you just get billed based on deliverables which is more comfortable for me because bill hours are, are, are useful in some space, some areas, but oftentimes there's a bit of, it's, it's just easier to just like, I'll use a billing rate to compute what I think the budget should be for a project. But in the end, it's much easier for me just to bill on deliverables. It feels better too. It's like you paid, yeah. you paid, you know, here's like, there's like three del deliverables for this project. And so it feels better as a consultant to say like, I've delivered this deliver, I've given this deliverable and you compensate for that. So how do you sell what products to take on, what products not to take on? Um, I think it's like, so I've almost pretty much always like, um, whenever someone's like approached me about a project, which in fact has been most of the case, been really cool. It's like, I, I sell them ever actually, which is maybe not, I don't know how sustainable this is, but almost all my work has been based on um, referrals and direct sole sourcing. So people will just come to me with a project because they hear about me or they know me already or they've been referred to me by, by a colleague or a client, which has happened a number of times. And so they'll come to me with a project. And so I will just, yeah, I'll just work with them and, and I, I don't turn those down. Um, sometimes those projects are outside of like what I, what my, what I see as my core value, um, or I shouldn't say core value, but maybe where I, I really want to go directionally with projects and where I want to see the vision of the company, but I also really want to make sure that I, I help them and, and help their needs. So, um, so I don't turn those down. It's really more on the, 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 if it's a public project, like a public, you know, government project where there's an RFP process, um, I'll evaluate if that project is aligned with, you know, one, if it's something I want to do, I mean, I'm quite busy now where it's like, I can actually decide not to pursue stuff because I feel like I've already gotten enough of my plate. Um, and so, and if it's not a project where I really either really want to do it and, or see it as perfectly well or really well aligned with my skill set and my offerings, then I just don't pursue it. Spencer, is there anything that I should have asked you that I haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about? I don't know. You've asked me a lot. I don't know. <laughs> cool. Um, can you, can you share your social media for you and your company? So people are going to reach out to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm actually embarrassingly not that involved on Twitter, although I know I should be, so I won't give that yet. I'll post at some points. Um, but, um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can just look me up on LinkedIn, just Spencer Cohen um, on link. You know, I'm on LinkedIn. You can also go to my website. It's called highpeakstrategy.com. And that's where I, um, you can learn about my company there as well. So. And to our listeners, we have a social media on, on the social, on the um, show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Jason Cabinet experience on your favorite platform. So Spencer, we're coming into a talk. Do you have any last minute advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Uh, no, just think like, you know, thanks again for inviting me. It's been really fun. And um, yeah, always happy to re-engage on this stuff and have further follow questions, you know, and just, yeah, just stay in, stay engaged, I guess, in all these topics. So yes, thanks <laughs> to the audience. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.